Hello, everybody. This is Liam Billingham, co-host of Oeuvre Busters. Before we jump into this week's episode on Along Came Polly, featuring Philip Seymour Hoffman, and with Mark Pagan of Other Men Need Help as our guest co-host, um, I wanted to read a couple of reviews. We got two new reviews this week. And um, thank you, Scala, so much for following instructions. The first one uh, is by Uncle Sean. And it's five stars, naturally. And it says, this is a podcast I have listened to. I enjoy the show. I was concerned I would have to have seen the films that were the subjects of the episodes, but the hosts do a good job of breaking the films down as they discuss them, such that the only time I really feel lost is when they do their Lars von Trier impressions, (laughs) because it sounds more like Werner Herzog. Well, you know, agree to disagree, Uncle Sean, but we do appreciate the review and we appreciate you taking the time to write it. And please encourage your friends to do so. The second review, much more succinct, uh, also five stars from Cat Rod. Wow. Two nerds talking about movies. What more could you want? Cat, thank you. Thank you for your review. And thank you for taking the time to do our Twister episode. I'm amazed you could still give me five stars. Give me, not George five stars after uh, being forced to be on the show, but we do appreciate it. Uh, These reviews really help people find the show. We could use more of them. Right now we have 20 ratings, so we're not moving up the charts with the ratings as fast as we are with the reviews. So I can only ask my mother to review the show and get um, so many iTunes accounts. So if you could please do it, that would be great. All right, I've spoken enough. Um, Please enjoy this episode on Along Came Polly. I'm Liam Billingham. I'm George Vergopoulos. I'm Mark Pagan. <gasps> oh no, three guys. And this is Mark. You have to say the name of the show. Ooh, <laughs> nice. I didn't know Hank Azaria was in this movie. More like Hank Azaria, like, am I right? It. Am I right? So what, movie, actually, are we, what movie are we talking so about? So we're talking about 2004's, I believe. 2004. Along that's Came Polly, Along Came starring Polly. Ben Stiller, the Jennifer Aniston, the Oh my God. Uh, yeah, amazing Jennifer Aniston. The amazing Jennifer uh, Aniston. Uh, and of course, featuring Philip, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Hoffman. Yeah, in a very in, uh, important role to this. Film, exactly. Actually. Yeah. Yes. So this is the first movie we've talked about where he has more than a, more than ten minutes of screen time. So <laughs> well, that's not true. Love Lisa. That. Come on. I apologize for looking at my phone, but I wanted to get the director's name. We all know you're rude. So and I'm, it's and I'm all, uh, John Hamburg. Do you yeah. guys know yes. anything about John Hamburg? From watching this, I did. I did some looking, but yeah, um, and I I listened to some of his commentary. Oh, how was that on DVD? It was okay. I actually thought it'd be I actually thought it would be more insightful, but he either was like very distanced from the movie, or he just was like, it's too bad because I thought he would I thought he would look at the movie in a way that wasn't pretentious, but like there was going to be some infectious energy behind it. He's like, right. yeah, but this is like a scene where he falls. Cause I just like, you know, like that brings like comedy. It's like, you know, like comedy, you know, you have to have moments like that. It's like, okay, who well. doesn't like a good prop fall? Yeah. Um, and then Philip Seymour Hoffman delivers in the prop fall department in this film. He does. We, I can't wait to talk about Philip yeah. Seymour Hoffman in this movie. So this guy wrote the Fockers movies. Oh, he was like he Ben Stiller's go-to guy. He did. He in did. The two, in the aughts. Is he still around? Is he still making things? He did. I love you, man. And, okay. um, what is I Love You, Man? Is that the one with, with Jim Paul Carey? Rudd oh. and um, Jason Siegel. Jason Siegel. Oh. And Paul Rudd is getting married. His his fiance insists that he has a best man. He doesn't have many male friends, so he sort okay. of dates fr- like he like has friend dates, and then has yeah. this this budding friendship with um, Jason Siegel. Uh, and it's about their like they're being adult men. It, actually, I think the premise is very. It's, it's a good. Cr- it's, it's a, good a very premise. good premise. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty. Like, there's. I. I have like a fleeting memory of it. I think I watched it during the beginning portion of a breakup. So it was like nothing was really. <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, nothing, nothing was, was really, registering. Yeah, oh, man. but he did breakup that. And then he did. Movies. Um, he did. Uh, uh, Ashton, not Ashton Kutcher. Um, uh, James Franco and uh. Brian Cranston. Oh, oh, oh! It just came out. Oh, like yeah. Two who's or the, three who, years the dead ago. man of the house or something like that? I know what you're yeah, talking about. Who's yeah. the boss? It's not uh, who's not the who's boss? the boss. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but something. He directed like a couple of episodes. Of who's the boss? <laughs> Some uh, episodes of. Grown he and Tony Danza go back. Yeah, go way back. He's yeah. seventy. <laughs> yeah. um, George, what's this movie about? So this movie is about uh, Ben Stiller, who plays Ruben. Ruben. Mm-hmm. Ruben Pfefferman. Ruben, Ruben Pfefferman. Yeah. Who marries uh, Deborah Messing's Lisa? 
And long story short, she cheats on him on the honeymoon with Hank H- Hank a, Azaria, a, fr- a very fit, a very French, very French, He's French, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not an accent. That's that's like yeah, that's actually what Hank Azaria sounds like. <laughs> the original Mo was very French. A, a um, Hank Azaria plays a scuba uh, instructor named Claude. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a self-contained underwater breathing apparatus instructor played Claude. Doing this really kind of terrible French accent. Yeah. You say terrible, I say. <laughs> Magnificent. I say mwah. Magnifique. Um, Lisa sleeps with Claude on their honeymoon, and this obviously kind of sends um, Ruben into this kind of spiral of obviously kind of despondency. Um, and it's basically just about Ruben uh, rediscovering love with. Through. Jennifer Aniston's character named Polly, who he meets at an art show, which his best friend, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Whose character's name is? I'm blanking right now. Oh, do you guys remember? <laughs> do you guys Seymour remember? Hoffman is. Um, he's got a good like child actor. Name. He does have a good yeah, child does. actor. I got it right here. And that's the whole thing. Yeah, Philip Sandy Seymour. Lyle. Yeah, Sandy Lyle. Yeah. And Philip Seymour Hoffman plays Sandy Lyle, who is this kind of uh, child actor who was you guess in a kind of film that was sort of like a Breakfast Club kind of film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because mm-hmm. Judd Hirsch was in it. That's what the and the poster makes it look like. Um, so they meet at this art gallery, and the film is basically about, obviously, kind of how Polly, who's this adventurous, free, free spirit. spirit, kind of gets Ruben to... Who's a risk analyst. Who's a risk mm-hmm. analyst. Yeah, he sells insurance. Who works for Alec Baldwin. Who works for Alec Baldwin. Doing an really early Trump. Role. Doing an early Trump. <laughs> That's a There's good. a lot of Trump in that This also... Yeah. I, I don't mean to interrupt. No, this please. is like the beginning of the Alec Baldwin as character yes. actor yes. transition yes. in his yes. career, which I think was like... I think in the future or not even the future like now books should be written about that especially for like aging leading men Mm -hmm. and regardless of what people say about alec baldwin like he did the most beautiful transition of like i'm going to keep my career going in the most interesting way he became a comedian he became a comedian he became like a strong character character actor for people and like well 2004 also that wasn't much before the departed which i feel like was a big oh god yeah patriot act like yeah. it was like a big moment mm-hmm. in his yeah um, it was really funny in the shadow <laughs> anybody know the shadow <laughs> so in october very so, funny and yeah, yeah so in the film alec baldwin plays like um ruben's really crass uh boss and one of the subplots has ruben trying to sell um or to <laughs> trying to decide I already to forgot sell about this insurance <laughs> to this brian like, what's his name the, the fx actor. guy yeah yes the fx guy yes. he was also in cocktail brian brian brown playing leland brian Van brown. Lee, Roy and brown yeah, will you please do the rest of it with that <laughs> accent i <laughs> ruben <laughs> i'm gonna jump off this building do a base jump yeah <laughs> who's this yeah kind of almost like a like a, a blend between like a richard branson and like a rupert murdoch mm-hmm. kind of uh totally figure i never thought of it like that and, that is and definitely true. ruben is trying to decide whether or not he's going to sell him insurance life right. insurance because he is such like a risk and yeah and basically at some point in the film ruben has to decide well does he go back to lisa because she comes back to him asking for uh to reconcile or whether or not he continues to like pursue this relationship with Polly. And spoiler alert, obviously, he decides to kind of stick it out with Polly. And also, L- Sandy Lyle, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, is forced to reckon with the fact that he's no longer... He's a has-been. He's a has-been, yeah. <laughs> and, and that is and, a long game And fall. that is a long game. The end. And there's a blind ferret in it, too, who steals, who steals the is show. Is he blind? Yeah. Oh, I guess he is yeah, blind. That's why he keeps running into things. Um, it's a really good psychiatry. Had you guys yeah. seen this movie before? I... Did I? So I rewatched it. It was only the second time I'd seen it. Rewatched it a few weeks ago, and I saw it. Sort of the same thing I remember with um, with the "I Love You Man" thing. I saw it when I I was living in South America and I moved back to the U.S. And so I'd gone to like Hollywood Video or something and gotten all these DVDs of things that I'd missed, like to catch up on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did um, you rent or buy? Uh, at Hollywood Video. Yeah. Did you find this in a 25 cent then? <laughs> I, I rented it. Uh, okay. I had to dog sit for my brother and I, I rented it with a bunch of other things and watched it. And it's interesting rewatching it. So this is part of my like my filter and, and something that I've I've seen. And there's a bit of projection on this, but I do think this is true. My read of the film, there is a lot of body shaming and there's a lot uh-huh. of male panic. Mm. There's a lot of male panic. And yeah. I watched it at a time when like my hair started, I was losing my hair. I was very conscious of like my body, my body was getting very hairy as well. And I watched it with sort of like this, I was very observant of the moments, like the screen time that was spent on um, sort of analyzing 
sort of uh, analyzing and and having like these calculated almost shots at uh, uh, insecurity and yeah. and, phys and, and physicalness mm -hmm, in mm -hmm, men. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, There's mm -hmm. a much better way to say that. So I saw it whenever like that was 2006, and that's what I remember from it. And I think in coming to see it again a few weeks ago, I was like, like what what are my takeaways from it? Remember the dance sequence? Remember Alec Baldwin? <laughs> and of course, I remember our, you know who we're talking about today. And I was and we'll get to it but there there are some things that like stuck with me over those 13 for those 13 years wow with yeah. with philip seymour hoffman's performance had you seen it before i'd never seen it before and i was shocked also to, i mean maybe not shocked completely but i i'd obviously heard of it but it was like a huge hit too it made like over 100 million dollars yeah. and i think the budget was only probably only like 30 or 40. i have barely any memory of the thing coming i out. definitely remember it. i remember well, it coming out but you like didn't I, see it then. no you i just i saw it yesterday for the first time had, had you guys me. see were you on like so this was at that, I'd say like peak career time for Ben Stiller. Mm -hmm. Were you guys on Post that boat? Of the, like, I loved Meet the Parents. I watched it. I saw. I saw Meet the Parents, but yeah, I've never I didn't seen see the sequel. Sequels. Um, yeah. what else did I like Ben Stiller do at the time? Was like Tropic Thunder was a little later. Right? Something yeah. about Mary was like ninety eight. I saw something. Something about Mary. Tropic Thunder was later. Yeah, he did the remake of um, Heartbreak Kid. Around Holy then. shit! I forgot that that existed. Which I can't remember if that's a Farrelly Brothers remake. It might be. Um, and then he did. What else were some of the like? He did some. There were some big kind of throwaway movies at that time. I'm going to my phone. Um, but yeah, I don't. Want to, should we like talk about his kind of like performance here too? I think what's interesting about this film is how, especially in terms of let's say the masculinity he represents, and kind did, of to like piggyback off of something. Did, I want to go. Sorry, go ahead. Did yeah. you like it? I, I, there are moments that I laughed without yeah. question. Did I like it? I would say no. Okay. But I definitely, I was not bored and there were definitely moments that I yeah. enjoyed. And whenever Philip Seymour Hoffman was on the screen, I was just kind of completely, completely enchanted. Did yes. you like it rewatching it, Mark? Not really. Like okay. I thought it's, it's a plain movie in a it's lot a of ways. It's a very plain movie. It's got, it, it has some great, great, great bright spots to it mm -hmm. and not so much. It really, I mean, it really comes down to like going back to the Alec Baldwin thing, it comes to like character actor choices in it. It's that, very smartly cast. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's what works. I don't even think the comedy is that strong. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there were so many, like, do, like, do we really need another, like, oh, my God, the toilet's overflowing gag? Do we really need another that fucking a... joke about, like, ethnic food? Yeah. And I realized, like, you know, yeah. like, to some degree, maybe we have advanced as a society in 14 years. In many other respects, we have not. But, like, those jokes were so tired, like, so tired. Do you guys feel like it's an interesting relic of a specific moment? Because it's before Apatow. It's, like, pre-Apatow by, like, a couple years. And it feels, there's some... It feels like it's there's some very But there's some very Apatowian moments in it mentioned... that are very... Very strong, when, but then there's this physical comedy Jim Carrey thing that you're like, what the fuck is going on? Mark mentioned I love you, man. I could have sworn that was Apatow, but uh, I don't think. Like, but that's like how I retroactively yeah. like read all these films and be like, oh yeah, these are just like Apatow films. Yeah, it's, I think that's why when I listened to the commentary, I went in more because I didn't think it's a strong film, but I could see. And you guys, I mean, you talk about this in the show when you see somebody working out ideas whether it's through performance or whether it's through, it's through like actual screen mm -hmm. manipulation, like through directing or writing. And sometimes they fail, but it's like, it's so fascinating. It was like, oh, I think I see what they're trying mm -hmm. to work out here. And that's what'll keep me coming back to this. So like, what's the deeper text? And I was hoping to hear some of that at least more embedded in the way that the director yeah. talked about it. Cause I was like, is he, I actually, I was like, there might be a chance that this guy is talking about sort of in some ways, there is like a degree of male menopause. There's a degree of mm -hmm. like isolation. There's a degree of like maybe self analyzing his own body or like the comparison points. And I was like, if that is actually what he's trying to work out through here, you know, I'd, I'd continue to see the movie. I don't think it's I don't think it's well executed, but um, and I don't think he was trying to do that for a mainstream audience. Yeah. But I was like, he came and went. Did I love you, man? Which I think does have some of that. Like it has some of those filters to it. Yeah. When you yeah. say um, analyze, you mean like the director is kind of you think the director is working or like commenting on his own issues with his body or considerations about his body? I don't or even know. The it's so interesting. And like with Philip Seymour Hoffman, I think he was meant to be such a proxy of like, mm. fat shaming in this movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a scene that doesn't even play for comedy where at towards the end, they're at. I can't remember. I think they're at Philip Seymour Hoffman's apartment and he's just eating chips. Yep. And, and then, uh, Ben Stiller makes a comment like, what do you, I, 
I, I actually had wrote, written down these notes and I, I couldn't find them when I came over here. But it's like, he almost just makes a comment like, what are you eating? What are you doing? Or like, should you be eating that? And he just pauses. And it's a cat, like yeah, it's an yeah. acting choice. Well, whatever. But, yeah, yeah, but there's like, there's no comedy there. Mm -hmm. It's, I, I those Moon moments shame. are fascinating That's to really me interesting. in this movie. And even the like, there's the comedy that plays like on the basketball court. Um, <laughs> I just what a yeah. yeah, which is funny too because I was thinking about that scene walking over here actually, and I was like, it's it's hilarious, it's funny because again he's so good at like selling it and like selling kind of like how you this character does believe in his own kind of like um, confidence in playing basketball. And yeah, obviously has, like, there's no a little skills. bit of his performance in Twister in this movie, but but on the other hand, I was thinking like, shit, wouldn't it have been like really funny and subversive actually if he could play like really well and that was like maybe like the only thing he does well in the film and everything yeah, else yeah. like he's incompetent and that would have been like an interesting like subversive yes, thing. I agree. So one thing that I felt like about this film was like there are moments where it is slightly subversive in terms of let's say it's representations of masculinity and like these types of men and in other ways it like so heavily cleaves to like the stereotypes and the cliches that it's like so upsetting so like the let's say like the french lothario it's like such a stupid cliche and i think like hank azaria the very little lady's given like does kind of transcend that role a little bit well and also that scene where he's having sex with deborah messing is such like a cuckolding moment like it's all about yeah. domination and like right. he's on top of her and like yeah. she's screeching and yeah. you're kind of like it feels very retrograde like totally yeah you know it's just interesting how the movie uses that as a visual gag but it's really whoa. yes but on the other hand for example like later in the film when um i believe his name's hobby right like jennifer aniston's like salsa uh, dancing mm -hmm. partner friend who again like initially comes across as this like masculine threat to like ben stiller's like ego right and then like quickly's like oh like we're talking about like i'm gay he's, oh like, i forgot about yeah, that yeah he's like oh it's like, well, and then everything's fine. Yeah, can I get lessons from you? And there's like a little bit of like subversion there. Mm. Um, so like this film again like has those moments where it has like interesting things to say about like again masculinity and about like male fragility and whatnot, but it doesn't like do enough of that. It's not critical enough. No, yeah. and I I think you're right with the choices. I think I like Tank Azaria. You know, I I He's have very to, funny. I have to say something. It is interesting watching Hank Azaria. Be careful because he listens to this podcast. This <laughs> I I think I could say probably all of it. Like we grew up with him, whether it's through The Simpsons yeah. or through like his his Bird choices. Cake. Yeah. And I have right. I now yeah. watch him at a distance because of the Apu uh, yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. that oh, Hari yeah. Kandabalu um, yeah. uh, brought up. It really yeah. And it like it has put it has put a it's it's actually filtered my yeah. my look at him now. And I, I actually don't think, you know, he's, I don't hold him totally responsible for anything. And I think there's just like, Hari has brought up like a very, very necessary no, cultural great, conversation. Yeah. But I, I rewatched it. I remember seeing this, you know, whenever I was 13 years ago. And, you know, of course, like, oh, Hank, like, oh, God, you're, you're, you're killing it. Yeah. And rewatching it this time. And he is. He's like, technically, he's performing really well. And it was so interesting seeing this later and being like, oh, man, you're just like, you're clowning a little bit yeah, and there's an othering of it there's yeah an to it as well but um and i think too i i just like with the with the very like like i'm I, yeah, nobody can yeah. see what i'm doing but the like muscly like brawniness of it mark's not doing anything he's just that muscular he's not just that muscular <laughs> shirt buttons just all popped off he's doing push-ups right now i mean his record which is yeah. amazing actually yeah. i do him so well that <laughs> you don't even he has yeah. an assistant holding the microphone yeah, yeah i um no, he, 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 yeah, like Hank is there. Like, obviously, like the first time you see him, he's like literally naked. Yeah. <laughs> right. Super film. ripped. Yeah. And he's super ripped, obviously. Yeah. And that kind of like sets, obviously, the kind of like Ruben on this course, right? Because a lot of the film is about kind of like him to some degree coming to a certain kind of like acceptance about him, who he is and not being um, so insecure. Well, and one thing I liked about the, the, the sort of plot line of the thing is it was about two people just dealing with their own bullshit. Like, there is like at the core like something good about what the movie is trying to get at, but it gets at it in such immature and yeah. kind of simplistic. Like it's very it's a it's a very easily digestible movie in a lot of ways, and what it's trying to say is really great. But there, yeah, there's just something retrograde and immature about a lot of the stuff at the core of it. I feel like is Jennifer Aniston oh, a God. manic pixie dream girl <laughs> in this movie? What do you? Th I really want to know what you. Th I I have can, a strong opinion. I have wait, a very we, complicated. Can we define that just very briefly? Manic pixie dream girl. 
Man, we can we can look it up. Term and... coined by Nathan Rabin mm-hmm. from the AV Club, okay. who actually wrote a watched every film that Philip Seymour Hoffman starred in and wrote a lengthy oh, essay yes. about it that I've sent to you about fifteen about times. 15 times yeah, yeah. But he he defined I a manic pixie times, dream yeah. girl based on Natalie Portman's character in Garden uh, yes. State, oh. and the idea was that it's a female character that exists solely for the. Advancement of yeah. the male's yeah, yeah, yeah. change mm-hmm. or the male's trans is that is that you got it yeah. I will I from the dic- the dictionary mm-hmm. little di- little dictionary a uh, type of female character depicted as vivacious mm-hmm. and appealingly quirky whose main purpose within the narrative is to inspire a greater appreciation for life and a male protagonist she turns the male fantasy of the manic pixie dream girl on its ear right so. Yes, I she uh, <laughs> yeah. Then yes. I think huh. this is like one of. I don't necessarily think that it's. I don't know what I was going to say. Something which I think could be problematic and weird. Like, is she a successful iteration of this yeah. like male fantasy or or this character type? But um, I think she is. I yeah, think she very much. Yeah, no, it's not, yeah, I I totally agree. So, so I agree, but I also think one of the best things about this movie is Jennifer Aniston. Yeah, by like leaps and bounds mm-hmm. because I feel like it made me. There's something well, she's so charismatic. There's and there's something charismatic, but there's also something in her mannerisms and her tics and her ways of being that that feel like an exaggerated version of real life. Hmm. Like there's just this kind of like I don't oh, thing that's like funny and real. Um, but she's like a movie star, and she, I feel like it's not all that different from what she did on Friends, but because it's on this canvas of a film and it's a movie it has like a very different effect on you watching it. And it's like very easy to be totally taken by her in this movie. And to think like, man, friends really kind of fucked up Jennifer Aniston's <laughs> yeah. career because she's a pixie, bank but I also, don't feel bad for her. I don't feel bad, but I also feel like very drawn to her as an actress. And I feel like the movie doesn't, but isn't un- she kind of playing just like, I mean, like a hyped up version of that Rachel character? Well, maybe yeah, but there's something messier about it and more totally. real. But I don't know if it's real, but I just, yes, she's um, has definitely has a quality of Manic Pixie Dream Girl. But I also felt like she's in a way, she, there's so much of her energy in it that mm-hmm. like, I honestly had a moment where I was like, man, if, if Jennifer Aniston had been born 20 years before, I feel like she'd be in every Woody Allen movie. And not just for the gross, uh, obvious yeah. reasons, but for the kind of energy that she had that no director has like successfully uh, that's really, taken advantage I, of. Yeah, you're, I can very much see her as a like a Diane Keaton surrogate if they were exactly. the same yep. of the, like, the Annie Hall uh, you know, era. Right. I could, yeah, I could see that. I could see that. God, that pillow that's one of those scenes the, the pillow um oh you know, destroy the pillows the life yeah. kind of no, destroy pillows. The yeah. pillow. right, 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 i did love yeah. that initial psych gag though where it takes him like 30 seconds to take all those throw pillows off the bed yeah. but yeah then it comes back in this sort of way of like destroy the pillows liberate yourself from the pillows like okay yeah <laughs> sure i feel like it's a bad version it's like a student film version of fight club like that moment <laughs> right like, <It's> like, <laughs> like i'm in class i have like 30 seconds to figure out like what kind of scene can i quickly draw up that shows my character oh, being the liberated pillows, it's the, the pillows, pillows yeah. of course just kill the pill it's, yeah. it's like the equivalent it's the of the system. it's just a couch scene in yeah. american beauty that's yeah. very profound when yeah. you're 16 and you're 30 you're like fuck this yeah. thing the um, pillow lobby is really going to come after us hard oh after this episode. God. Fuck. This episode Sorry, brought to you by Bowl and Branch. <laughs> no, they don't make pillows. Yeah. Fuck. They could make pillows. They can make pillows. No, but yes, there's, again, also like her character too, where there's it's just very kind of cliched. And even though she brings energy to it, yeah. a certain vivaciousness, what have you. Uh, yeah, the material, like she can, I think, transcend the material that she's given. She's great. Yeah. Um, speaking of transcending the material... Can we talk about Philip Seymour Hoffman in this it. movie? How amazing it is! Um, I l- was laughing out loud. So, do you want to also s- t- tell us about like obviously the running gag throughout this film, in terms of, like Philip Seymour Hoffman? Are you talking about Jesus, Jesus Christ Superstar? Oh well, well don't you remember? He's like he's he's part, he's taking so place the, in like a community theater production. Yeah, of okay, Jesus I thought, okay, I thought yeah, there was something else. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I think there's two running gags. One is the the fact that he hasn't he's hired a film crew to do an oh, yes. true Hollywood Sorry. story, yeah, which also speaking of casting, Judah Friedlander and, and Kevin Hart. <laughs> that was the that was the biggest shock. Thirteen years later, did you guys catch speaking of random casting? Who is sitting behind Philip uh, Ben Stiller at the wedding? On the stage, uh, Jeff, um, the the roast guy, 
Oh, Jeff Ross? Jeff Ross is just sitting randomly on the stage in the background. So much so that I paused the movie, looked it up, and was like, Jeffrey Ross is in Along, Jeffrey Ross is in Along Came Polly. And I was like, I'm sure he's going to show up again. Never shows up in the oh, movie that's again. that's interesting. But he's just sitting on the stage behind Ben Stiller. But yes, there's an E! True Hall... What you think is an E! True Hollywood <laughs> story crew, but it's really just like friends probably from NYU that Philip Seymour Hoffman's character yeah. has hired. And there's also the fact that he's in a in the... It's the Hell's Kitchen Community Theater, theater. production of Jesus Christ right. Superstar. Playing Judas. Judas and hopefully Jesus. And hopefully Jesus. He wants to play both roles, but unfortunately he can't. <laughs> Which I do have to say, then I don't mean this against anything, any any way that that he looks or that Philip Seymour Hoffman look physically. Um, as, a, as an adult man, I do think he is, regardless of like his talent, acting talent, or like who, yeah. how, why he got cast... I think he is, he looks like somebody who is probably like the cutest child actor kid or like, yes. the, like yeah. he, 100. he like that actual, that casting decision besides him being, you know, for whatever reason, uh, what's his name? Hamburg decided to cast him. Like just looks alone casting wise. I was like, that's perfect. Like I could yeah. totally, I totally buy it. I can totally buy it. Absolutely. Being like either whatever it is, the like hot shot kid or like the cute yeah. kid or um, and he's never gotten over his con- like the confidence he had as like as a, a, kid, as a yeah. hot shit thirteen year old boy yeah. who like it's so great and he's so fucking funny he's hilarious yeah because he's really liberated in this movie from like I mean what's the movie we watched just before this we watched Red Dragon Red Dragon well Lo- and, and Love Lisa. Lisa and they're all sort of tight knit tight ra- I mean even in well Red Dragon there's a little bit of like well, I don't give a fuck yeah mm, well that's fuck how it. I thought it was yeah well um, the character definitely is like I don't give no, a fuck the, yeah the character is yeah. like I don't give a fuck and in this there's a different thing and, and one, of, having fun. one of my he's favorite fun. moments in the film is <laughs> early on in the film when he's recognized by the chef who's like you're the guy kid from the movie and he goes ugh ugh yeah <laughs> yeah and it's just like we were talking you early on you talked about his physicality as an actor but just the way he manifests this kind of like you get the whole character yeah. and uh like it's just it's just very, and it's also sad it's like it's sad from that moment and then that makes the oh, rest man, of it yeah. really funny because he's so the basketball scene is like is like legendary it's amazing i couldn't get over how and that scene that he has at the end i forgot what the actor's name with ben Stiller's dad where so they're backstage like he, oh that's the, right the performance of jesus christ was a complete disaster and basically like his dad says something along the lines of like hey listen like you lost it like it's gone but it could come back like the future can still be yours <laughs> and it's this beautiful scene it's this beautiful moment and then, and then like felicity more hoffman's like i don't think i've ever spoken to you in my life yeah. <laughs> or something like that it's really good and it like, takes us to heart and it's kind of like obviously like you know, there's some sort of kind of epiphany, but mm. also just the whole thing of like, who the fuck are you? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. Also, by the way, 2004, apparently we have to explain what sharding is. <laughs> oh, he sharts his pants. Yeah, he sharts his pants, and then he tells like Ben Stiller, like, oh, I just sharted my pants. Like, what? what? So this is interesting because it also, it brings back like one of the first jokes of this movie, is one of the first funny, is when he just falls. He just falls you walking just, yeah. up to yeah, and and it's, it's during the wedding or the it, right you, before the wedding. You sort of talked a little bit about maybe the body shaming or the things that go on in this movie, and it's like, one thing that every director seems to take advantage of in movies starring Philip Seymour Hoffman is Philip Seymour Hoffman is chubby. Like, it's just an inherent part of every character that he plays, and it's emphasized or de-emphasized. But just the decision to, like, have him shard himself, like, like there's a weird contradiction in this guy being on the elevator and being like, yeah. I'm so fucking horny. And, like, I watched <laughs> yeah. that scene ten times because I wanted to watch every single person's reaction in the elevator. And it's kind of amazing because everyone has a little bit of, like, yeah, I can't really <laughs> but it's a little bit of like what did that guy say like just the decision to make a lot of the jokes around him be driven by his physicality like the way he shoots the basket and like is terrible at it or the way he blocks or he uses his weight and also the scene where like in that basketball scene where that other guy takes his shirt off and like the ultimate humiliation is getting the sweat of a fat man on yeah. you like it's really well, but he's also hairy too right yeah. but it yeah. doesn't it doesn't play great well, this is, I think it goes back to what Mark was saying. I don't know if that's what you had in mind, too, because I think you mentioned, like, you, you said something about, like, a certain kind of masculinity that's hairy. And I have a feeling of, like, if you were thinking about that particular scene. I was thinking about that. I think there was, like, there were a few, there were, like, three, not key moments, but there are three key sort of tiers or areas of, um, of sort of self-investigation or shaming. And mm. that's what I was waiting to, to like really analyze from the directors, which side does he fall mm. on? Is this somebody who's sort of like, 
this is the the film reflects a level of like self investigation or like insecurities right. or is this is it falling more on the side of like this is this is weird i'm going to call out a weird or a thing that i'm going to other so we have like we have the hairy the hairy dude we have like the big hairy dude we have um you know mostly through philip seymour hoffman's character like there's a bit of body shaming there and then the third area maybe and i it it might be just like it's it might be through Hank Azaria. There's all, I mean, there's just all the, the uh, with, it's so big. You know, there are those areas yeah. of like, of intimidation there. Oh, that's I, right. Early on, you mean when, when yeah. they're looking at his penis? But I, um, I was really interested. I watching this with Philip Seymour Hoffman, like watching, like really watching it for him, you know, when I was going to talk to you guys. I remember, I really remember, you know, the fall. I remember the basketball scene. Like are you, those are, those stand out. But rewatching it, I was. They were just with the basketball. I, can't, the I, can't, I was like, left. this guy. He's tremendous physically in all the other ways. Like I was just watching how controlled, organically, how controlled his yeah. walks are. Uh-huh. Like his yes. walk yes. is for this character. And I was like, you're not gonna. If we put this next to, I haven't seen Red Dragon, but if mm-hmm. we put this next to Red Dragon, you're not missing out much. <laughs> if we <laughs> put like Philip Seymour Hoffman the, like yeah. walking scenes next, like we're gonna see a distinction. Yes. There is a very like yeah. even that like. That level of like manipulated mm-hmm. um, uh, sort of understanding and walk, right, and yeah. that could also have been so broad. And that, those are the areas where, like, holy shit, that's talent! Mm. Like that could have been yeah, played really in such a different way. Because these are like these great kind of walking, talking scenes. They're brief with Ben Stiller just you know showing up even after the fall or leading up to the fall. Um, the other thing I read is that. Uh, and this is this is an interesting. I don't know if you guys how you guys feel about their friendship on screen, and how they work together as actors. Uh, ben was heavily into improvising. Philip Seymour Hoffman, not at all. Uh, I'm not surprised. That's so interesting because yeah. it feels like he he's improvising in a lot. Of it does movie, because he's so goddamn good. But I can totally see that, huh? That's interesting. I think it might play into their relationship in an interesting way. Like I think. I think that's if the you know director like I'll give him credit like we knew that it's like that might be an interesting choice for how the two work off each other as those characters. Yeah. Um, but I don't know how did you guys feel about them working together on screen and then their their characters as yeah. as because there's like there's also there's the other side of this too where it is you know leading to I love you man like. Bromantic, bromance. Yeah, there's there's, there's a, a lot of sort of investigation and friendship here, and uh, I I think there is like some potentially very beautiful moments that exist in this, but believable friends. Yeah. I think I don't think they're believable friends. I've, I didn't think about it in those terms. They feel like movie friends to me. Hmm. Well, they seem so different. I was, really I was like, different. how is it that they do we they find went out to school they, together they went because to Polly remembers Him Phil from school, Hoffman right. from school okay, as well. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, but no, they seem like movie friends. They also both seem like movie stars in the movie. Like you don't. But we all have that one friend, right? That seems like an outlier, and then our other friends are like, "How are you friends with that person?" I'm looking at him. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Hey yo, hey yo. It's too close to home. Shouldn't have asked that question. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I get what you're saying. Also, because I obviously like Phyllis Seymour Hoffman's character is like is such a foil to like Ben Stiller's more like tightly wound up. But he character. has an arc too in the movie. He's oh, not no, without yeah, question. Yeah. He's definitely like a. It's no, a no, but he is there very much so to be like an opposite to him. Yes. Yes, right. that's true. Like, there's that also that funny part, like after he sh- uh, the party after his shards, where like Ben Stiller <laughs> turns to him and he's like, he's like, you're the most disgusting human being I've ever met, yeah, or something yeah. along those But lines. again, it's like one thing that's interesting about that and the body shaming is like he's in he, a lot of the comedy around that character is driven by the fact that we're supposed to laugh at him, and I don't because he is, you know, portly and like he shards himself and like kind of has no filter and like. Phil Hoffman is very good at looking like a guy who's like stayed out too late the night before or like isn't feeling well or like he yeah. doesn't you know it's interesting that he wouldn't improvise because it's like it just it, it makes you question like how the performance was written and all these different things and also one thing I noticed in this film is that Ben Stiller's shtick is really tired at times like he's just oh, sort of, totally. he does that Ben Stiller thing where he's like well I just because you just yeah because and you're like okay but Ben, ben that, do something yeah. else like it's a little it's a little much but 
to come back to it, I think that one of the things that makes his performance kind of subversive is there's a quality in Phil, Phil Hoffman to be like, yeah, I'm a chubby guy and I'm going to be fucking confident about the space that I occupy. And like he really like the way he plays basketball is so funny because like chubby guys in movies aren't supposed to be yeah. aren't supposed to have that level of enthusiasm or eagerness. Or They're not supposed to be confident. Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that he's like, fuck it, yeah. like whatever is pretty yeah. hilarious. I think he looks great in his out and his costumes too. Like the costuming here, I think is very interesting. But I do think it goes to your point. He plays confidence really well really, for this really character, well. and those clothing choices I think are meant a bit to mock him. But I I think he looks great he in the like even on the basketball court. And then that like that blazer that like rolled up. Like, that is blazer. such a good look. I think yeah. it's like no, it it's like oh so. shit. Like I would. It's he's rocking it. I think he looks great. I think it works. I I I think it works for the character. I also can see sort of like this aging New York actor. This is a, right. a, such a New York City movie. Yeah. Also, I think yes. it's worth it. It yeah. really feels like it, it gets the city it, that time and that place. I and feel that like era you did a, a good bit. job of like putting her in a realistic New York City apartment. Also, like it is a hole in the wall. Yeah, it's like, it is tiny. It is not like it's not like this majestic like three bedroom. Like the friend's apartment. <laughs> like that the friend's apartment drives me crazy yeah. still. Yeah. So like you feel like again like the how tiny her apartment is relative obviously to his like spacious yeah. obviously home in like the suburbs. And there is that kind of like um, distinction too, right? Because there's like there's a very brief discussion of like what it means to live in the city, what it means to live in the suburbs, right? Like Polly associates kind of the suburbs with like this kind of like drudgery. It's like banality of existence. Fascist, man. And fascist, yeah. They're all out in the suburbs. So it's like this interesting kind of like discussion of like what city life is like yes. in relationship to yes. kind of what like Ruben's life is I like. One thing I wish the movie did a better job. So she lives in Soho, right? Oh, She's that, a waitress that, that lives in Soho. I think okay. so. It looks like Soho. But I was, I really wish they told us where he lived. I mean, clearly it's like probably the Upper East Side, but I wanted to know oh. desperately where Ruben's apartment was because I think that that's a little bit of... It's interesting to think about Holly, uh, New York movies and like how when you live here, <laughs> we live here, how that changes your relationship to like watching a movie or like where characters mm-hmm. live. Because it, I mean, like they they cut out that scene where like it slowly like pans out and you see like holy shit, he's in Trump Tower. And, like, it's like, <laughs> no, it's like I should have known it. Not Ruben. But like the specificity of the fact that like he gets married at the beginning and it's a Jewish wedding. Like that's that's very that's very specific and that's Ben Stiller and like I think that that's part of it. So, but I so I but I wish I got like a little more context for that. Yeah. Like sort of like the living and where he lived and, and who he was. But it's also an interesting Ben Stiller performance because he's wrapped so tight as mm-hmm. always. But I was going to say, isn't like his character also like a cliche, right? He's like, yes. he's like playing like a cliched, like uptight, like Jewish guy. Right. And you know, like that. Though there's not a lot of Jewish jokes. No, thankfully. Yeah. Except but, when he gets lifted up on the, um, for the, oh, I forgot about the, yeah, the, yeah, the I was wedding like, scene. No one who's yeah. gone to a million Jewish weddings in their life, like a Jewish kid would mm-hmm. be like, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Like that was a really yeah. bad joke. <laughs> like, the, so I was like, this, the, there's like a 99 percent chance that I'll fall off this. <laughs> like I could see it make this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, that's and again, annoying. it was like one of these things where it's like I just kept like like all these characters are like cliches, and yes. while sometimes maybe it's not Philip Seymour Hoffman totally, but even him is like the failed child actor. Um, and I do think that Jennifer Aniston's performance transcends the cliche of the character as written. And I think Deborah Messing isn't I, bad. I was going to ask that too, because like, can we briefly like, talk about she her She does character? a little she, bit with that. And does. my favorite scene in the movie is when she comes back. And this is what I was talking about, the Apatovian thing, if, that, if we can use that term. She comes back to the apartment and there's a brief moment where the camera lingers on her. And then it cuts to Ben Stiller and they're both upset. And then it cuts to Jennifer Aniston. And there's like maybe 15 mm-hmm. to 20 seconds of silence and no one talks. And I was like, this is a very Apatow moment, like in the midst of this like comedy that's broad to have a moment of like real human pain. And like no one says like you cheated on me, but yeah. just to watch people sit in their uncomfortability is like way better than most of the way the, this the w- way better than how most of this movie handles emotional stuff. Yeah. Like I was like, wow, this is from a better movie. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, also at some point she says something, I think right after, right? He catches her sleeping with Claw, which says, like, I was scared or something. I forgot exactly what mm. term yeah. she uses. Yeah, there was something that was, I was, I had a pause. Yeah. Not, I, not, I did not pause. I just had a, I had a pause watching that going like, oh, that's more reflective than I would give a movie like this yeah. credit for. I wouldn't expect them to. And I, I, I had that moment too. I was like, oh man, lean more into that. Yeah. Like, I just want to see more of that in here. Just details and a little bit of the um, uh, 
I mean, that's, I mean, it led to Apatow who would yeah. lean into those moments where you, we as audiences were like, we came in for the John Hamburgian or the Farrelly brothers style, yeah. like Pratt Falls. And then like these quiet moments that he would go, fuck it, I'm going to lean into these. I'm not necessarily here advocating for like the work of Apatow. I do like a lot of what he's done, but there's some really good stuff. There's, there. there's like those, there was those surprising moments in Knocked Up where he's like, oh, he's really, he's, he's really allowing this thoughtful to, to, yeah, to sit and have two characters two characters say basically you mean something to me and like when whatever level of reflection or, right. or or text that is so i don't know maybe it's it's one of these questions too and like we can get into like be- deeper things but like zeitgeistian is this sort of culturally where we were moving with comedy is this something that's beyond like was apatow sort of already he was just already set up to be like he was yeah. already yeah, kind of having, like our 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 film needs or like our viewing needs were sort of we're we're moving. I have all of these like theories too about just culture like post nine yeah. eleven with like our viewing habits and you know other things post uh, post nine eleven, but also things with like um, technology. God, we don't need to go down the rabbit hole. Well, kind but of, like, well, yeah, no, it reminds me of like what Tolstoy said about something. like Napoleon, right? Like the history kind of made him inevitable. Don't you fuck it. So that's like well, like Apatow, like was <laughs> yeah. an inevitability of our historical moment. Um, but also, but yes, I just very briefly, I do think, uh, yeah, I think Deborah Messing does like a great job with like what it could be like a very one dimensional, like one note character. She's a good actress, yeah. and that there is this, like this sense of like is this yeah. after yeah. Will and Grace? This was during, during no, during, yeah, I think that's right. She was, yeah, I, I find her career really surprising. Granted, like it's not, it's not um, that unique to say, you know, to offer like the commentary that people working in television have a hard time moving into film. But I'm like, I am surprised about her. Like, I am surprised yeah. at that. She seems like somebody a number. I just, I just think she's somebody like a number of directors would have like. I'm grab like I gotta grab. Well, that makes me think about Jennifer Aniston too, because like, is Jennifer Aniston like almost too iconic for her own good? We said that she was like a victim of friends. Like she can't get away from being Rachel Green. She might, yeah. Like who, like where, like maybe she was, maybe she was better suited to be the like muse in an independent film, or like not to be generic about it, but just to think about like there's 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 a depth to her on screen that that really is underutilized and there's been attempts like there was that film the good girl yeah it was just, and other things yeah. that like tried to get somewhere with jennifer and Anderson the that leprechaun just never... movie she made right? <laughs> and picture really perfect with <laughs> jay moa jay moa is picture perfect uh the kevin bacon one i think it's isn't is it, is it kevin bacon let me look it up or i think it might be kevin bacon. just any movie i just remember iconic movies where they had like iconic cutaway scenes to kevin bacon that was one where he's just like he's being very yuppie and just sitting there and yep, it's kevin like bacon. it was almost like a like a like a sitcom opening yes um and yes. i just remember i've never seen it but just the commercials and it's like but then there was another guy and it's just kevin bacon yes like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. i don't know that i've ever Is thought about that, him, him to be like him that Kevin Bacon? Yeah. Should we do J- Jennifer Aniston for season three of Uber oh, wow. Busters? Of course, yeah. Maybe. I still need to see that Leprechaun movie. I've never at Leprechaun. I haven't seen that one. Um, now you said you wanted to talk about something earlier about Casavides. Oh yes. Well, hold on, hold on, guys. Sorry. Hold on. Um, I also think one thing that I want to come back to is this idea at the end of the film that these guys kind of like find a closure in. Yes. They like, like Phil Hoff or Phil's character realized, oh no, I actually. Oh, okay. I think you meant Hunk Azaria. Hunk Azaria. Ben Hunk, and, is Hunk Azaria and Ben Stiller are having a moment. It's like, hey, thanks, man. You really taught me which a lot is, about myself. Which I didn't like. I liked it. I thought it was a nice moment. Again, it's ridiculous. The only the only thing that annoyed me about that scene is that there's a certain almost kind of like that it could be read in a misogynistic sort of way. Of like in the sense of like, oh yeah, we're you know, like we're boys. Like we're never gonna let a woman get between us. Even though obviously they're not friends. And that's the only reason that scene also like to me read like it's like, oh, maybe it's like an interesting scene because again he kind of like has made sort of Ben Stiller's That's how I read it. Has He's made, made peace with like himself made peace and, and the, made peace yeah. obviously with like Hank Azari again. <laughs> Just another like force of uh, history, right? Yeah. But the other part of it was also like, uh, I don't know, is this kind of like is there like a certain kind of latent misogyny to that? I didn't read it that way, but I certainly see how you might read it that way. I read it more as like, this is a guy who like 
can forgive his worst enemy because he's realized that the problem was maybe in inherent to his own choices in life. Like, but then again, that's problematic because then the, maybe the problem is the woman, which obviously is not true. Well, and I'm I saying, think like how all the blame so is the put movie on the handles, woman. But then again, Ben Stiller has the moment where he's like, I don't want to be with you, but it's not like he's like, you're a monster. He's right, just like, yeah, you yeah. made a mistake. Right. No, and yes. I don't want, and I, like, I'm glad the, the treatment of that is much better than it could have been. And that goes back to like what I was saying earlier about like, yes, we're like double messing characters given a bit of humanity by saying like, I was confused. I was frightened. Like, I didn't know what I was right. doing. Yeah. She's not a monster. Yes. Yes. So I thought that was interesting. Mark, but any thoughts on that? On the on that ending? Did you pause? I'm mixed. On that <laughs> I'm a little mixed on it. Yeah, I I'm I'm on both sides. As a viewer, it's nice to see the opposite of like what what was what could potentially be set up as a villain, and see like the you may like anything. Um, Man, we're really giving a lot to Long Came Polly here. <laughs> like and talking about like the history of of sort of mythology and 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 um and storytelling. Well, we, we saw the two and a half hour cut. Right? Yes, yeah. 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 Mine Produced was by four. Christopher Nolan. Yeah, it was. Well, at least you were very Max specific. Ophels. You're, you. <laughs> At some point, there's like just 13 seconds of the like you watching the shore. It's the like. first Max Ophel's <laughs> joke on the show. I'm very proud. It's, it's a very, very deep hashtag cut, yeah. proud dad moment. Um, one thing that I think we've talked about, but we haven't directly covered, and something that we love to talk about, and I think you like to talk about, is sort of the masculinity. But especially like watching this film, was there anything that you we kind of have already addressed this, but that Red is like, man, this is toxic. Like in the same way that. Well, I was looking whenever I watch comedies from this era, I sort of look for the moments where I'm like, like watching, uh, like there's, um, watching red dragon. The, the F word is dropped. Like he refers to his son using the F word. And I remember thinking like, Oh, that wouldn't have bothered me in 2003. But now I'm like, Oh, I know that's not a comedic moment. Was there anything that stood out to you as just like, oh, why is this? Yeah, there there was. I I do think that's like, especially with the ending, I think there was, there's also, um, there were some opportunities to really lean into tenderness here, which Mm -hmm. the show didn't do. And there wasn't, there's, there's a, there's really a, again, it comes back to like the body shaming. There is, there is. I was really hoping for like, oh man, listen to this commentary. Like, give me more. Like, let me hear from you. Let me, let me at least like dissect a little bit that this is something that you're working out some ideas and it's not so much that you're, you're doing the shaming or that you are doing the othering, but you're actually sort of maybe walking through like some, how we identify others. Yeah. But I think beyond that, I, I'll just go back to the manic pixie dream. I feel, feel like that generally is, yeah. is like right there is, is such a, particularly toxic element i think so much it's so my, obvious the movie i hate that um as a manic pixie dream girl and i know people that love it is 500 days of summer i think that's the uh, most i hate that movie i think that is the obnoxious. most it is the most quietly misogynistic, so misogynistic movie that has like it is like and i i think the people that are behind it like i not not the talent i think they they do a great job and I, I see elements like this culturally. We've we've sort of allowed this passable, because also we give our male protagonists such a um, such a pass with like yeah. um, neuroses, nice guyness. Yeah. And which what we're what we're really looking at isn't isn't we're not really seeing the reflection of like what these traits are. Um, and we give them an out as well with like having a what textually is like a whorish wife yeah we're giving and like we're, it's a yeah. possessive yeah. thing too. we're giving yeah. a, a whorish wife who is is uh you know the the equivalent of um uh a jezebel is that the right like but basically i know that's like racially yeah. infused but you know just seeing like a big dick daddy who yes. uh, yeah well that's the source of the joke with deborah messing yeah I like too um, so I, I think there are a number of elements which I wanted to give him more credit for the the filmmaker, but maybe he maybe he is working through this stuff. I I think I yeah. think it'd actually be interesting to look at look at his work. I I haven't seen I Love You Man in a number of years. I haven't seen I've seen Meet, Meet the Parents, but I haven't. It'd be yeah. there. There is like a I can see these themes continuing to pop up in these films, and I'd be interested in looking at them as a whole, seeing if it's like. Oh wait, I actually think he might be having some commentary. I don't think he is. I yeah. think one 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 sort of creative um, 
part of the this that we haven't talked about is Ben Stiller. Not that he's obviously not played a huge role in this movie, but like Ben Stiller is obviously very particular about the films he makes and the choices that he makes. And so much of the neuroses that play out in this movie feel like Ben Stiller neuroses, whether it's like being cheated on, sort of that anxious kind of like risk assessment kind of thing. Like, and so I wonder how much of how much of the sort of story is actually a, from a Ben Stiller or how much of the, the, the stuff that the film deals with could come from like obviously a very creative c- creatively inclined producerial kind of actor who's going to put his print on what he expects the movie to yeah. be and also one who I think like he made Tropic Thunder he's no idiot yeah. so the casting of Philip Seymour Hoffman obviously Phil, Ben Stiller at that point in his career could have been like I don't want this guy to be in this movie and it's it's a strong choice to, to, to kind of make but also one thing that I've heard apocryphally is that the part was written for Jack Black. Huh. I could see that. There's a lot of Jack Black in this performance because yeah. Jack Black is the forever confident chubby guy. Yeah. Um, and we haven't really talked about the scene, and this actually came up on Twitter yesterday. This guy, Nick Hewson, tweeted the part of the movie where he's yes. like, yes, <coughs> yeah. <coughs> and then he has the speech in front of the, the risk assessment speech, and he was like, God, what an ability this guy has to bring something elevated to a movie as like mundane. As, yeah, no, that scene is hilarious. As this, because it, I don't know. It's well, just... right before he goes into the office, too, he says, I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. I'm an actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then he goes in. And it starts off, obviously, like a train wreck, and he quickly kind of like... And the reaction shots of Baldwin are fucking yeah. priceless. Just being like, what are, you, what are you doing? Yeah. Well, wait, going back to the toxic masculinity thing, though, that's very much kind of like represented by like Baldwin's character. Oh, the ass slap and the Oh, and the, the ass bathroom. slap. Yeah, the, the, like, obviously, the like the All good things. Peeing. All good things. And the also peeing. Oh, also, he's shaking his dick. Well, yeah, and he makes the uh, like the gesture with the microphone like during the wedding or something. Oh, that's right. Tell, like Deborah messing not to like you know like, yeah. sleep with him too much because um, he has to go back to work. But then also at some point he's like, oh yeah, like Ruben, take care of that because I'm going to like the, the Bahamas with my mistress mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. So you like he's like the toxic like masculinity in this film, and obviously it's all played for like laughs. Yes. Um, but he's I think like the representative of that in this film. I'm glad I watched it though. I am too. I had a good yeah. time. It's definitely like kind of like a time capsule. It feels like it a feels specific like a, moment. Yeah. Is there anything else we want to say about Along Came Polly? Something about Cassavetes. Fucking Susan you know, about here's the thing. I want to talk about Cassavetes, <laughs> and then I realized midway through I don't know exactly what I wanted to say about it, except that we <laughs> saw husbands together. So you, you're this whole and podcast that was a transformative is experience, Mark I'm and sure. I saw husbands together. So this whole uh, podcast damn? is Mark's fault. Yeah, yeah we. We went on um, a, we were one of date. like four people in the theater, but we went on a, but that's also like we went on a Friday afternoon, a summer Friday, summer Friday. That's right. Two years ago. I hadn't seen it. It was one of those movies, but generally with Cassavetes, um, I, you know, like even going back to like videos, like, I don't, I don't want to take this home. Like, I don't want to watch a cat. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to go home and watch a Cassavetes <laughs> I've seen a lot of them and most of them have only been. idiots would be. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I, I usually will have to go them. to a theater to do it, but I, so like I go to a theater and I just walk out and I'm missing a complete, a, I'm punch drunk. Yeah. yeah totally. Um, you yeah. Prepare yourself emotionally and psychologically. God, you know? Yeah. And husbands too. I haven't, I hadn't seen it before. It's like, my God, that's a gut punch. It's a gut punch. Do you remember the walkouts? Vaguely, maybe that's why I'm thinking four people. I know you mentioned that, but do you remember when they were walking out? Uh, one walked out during the scene with in the, him and, and the British girl, yeah. where he won't leave her alone. And then there was a walkout earlier in the movie that I can't remember what it was. But interestingly, and I I don't know why I recall this, except that when you go to BAM on a Friday afternoon for a Cassavetes experience, you tend to see only white men. Mm-hmm. The three walkouts were people of color, mm-hmm. um, and I just remember noticing that and being like, "That's that's interesting." Yeah. The, the, it sort of a, it made a quiet impression on me. Did, I can't remember. Did you guys do a husband's episode? We did, yeah. Yeah, that was the whole sort of bent for the season as we wanted to talk about the Dick Cavett in that movie. Yeah. We did every movie, I think. We did do every movie, yeah. Yeah. Even the ones that are kind of not Cassavetes films, <laughs> as I like to put it. Um, do you... Do you... Did you like Husbands? I did. I think it's... I think it's um, kind of like one of those. Nece- it's canon. Mm-hmm. I think it would be canon for me. And um, but I think generally he's work. He's uh, speaking of the same conversation of Hamburg. I think people are doing it in different. Like there are genre directors that are working out yeah. some incredible 
ideas and they're doing it so slyly. Mm -hmm. I think Cassavetes in some ways is a little bit more deliberate, a little bit more yeah. obvious, although his, his work is so abstract and so hard to digest. But I think that he's a problematic guy that is working out his problematic areas um, very nakedly mm -hmm. and very and honestly. He knows it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one of those like peak films, those peak peak films I saw. It's just I I I think that and um and a Chinese book he had like to rewatch. Oh, I haven't amazing. seen that in yeah. so long. It's one Dude. Of, it's, I, I would put it above husbands personally. I would but. yeah, it's in the top the top. It's really amazing. I think it's a really important. American Alamo movie. Yonkers is playing. Yeah, I was considering oh, going to see it up there. It. Yeah. For a minute I was like, what's Alamo Yonkers? Is that a John Cassavetes? <laughs> yeah. movie? You know, it's his Western. Just only shows Cassavetes <laughs> films, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um before we wrap up. Uh, do you want to talk about your show, your you Patreon? Should. Your we, show, yeah. People should hear about. Yeah. People should know Mark. It's very you much on brand show. with what we've been yeah, talking about. Yeah. Today. Yeah, yeah. Well, I feel like you picked this movie because you think about these things. I do, yeah. Because, like I said, the reason that I the the show that I I host and produce is called Other Men Need Help, and it's a it's a playful, a very playful look at the um, emblems, habits, and struts, and the male performance, and the um, deeper insecurities and what they're really trying to hide um and you're raising so, money and we're raising money for season three we've done two seasons uh i love doing the show it is i am fascinated by just how we all perform i'm fascinated i'm fascinated by um i'm fascinated by like the mytho the self-mythology of the nice guy and the mythology and i think that's those are sort of the darker areas that we need to be paying more attention to mm -hmm. now i don't think our show I don't think our show is very academic at all. I think it's a lot of fun to listen to and it's very it honest. Is, yeah. I agree. Um, but part of the reason with Along Came Polly, like I said, I I started the, you know, other men exist because of reflection during times in my life. And I was 27, I think, when I saw this. And uh, I was feeling pretty shitty. I was mm. just, yeah, I was just like, I was in my 20s and I wasn't owning... I don't know. I, I don't think that conversations happens too often for, I'm, I'm not trying to give too much sympathy. You know, fuck it. I'll give sympathy to everybody. <laughs> like everybody needs, everybody has hard times. Yeah. And I think regardless, we don't give enough sympathy to, um, I, I think there, there are lost periods for everybody. And I had yeah. periods in my twenties where it's like, I'm not hearing this reflected. Like I feel like I've, I'm, you know, my body is changing and I'm having sort of like a second hormonal shift in my life. Anyway, along came Polly, came during that time, yeah. and um, I it stuck with me for these thirteen years, thinking about you know some of these ideas. But uh, but yeah, our show, uh, I guess our show would sort of look at the Ben, like the real life Ben Stiller character, and find out like the truth behind the manic pixie dream girl. Like right. honestly, like dude called her like ten times a day. It's creepy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And she's like, and like we we think she's she's like, yo, I'm not talking to you because you know, that's like the real truth there. Or he he did go and do the salsa lessons, but he also Where can we find your show? You can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts. Um we just started Patreon. So I've somebody's listening wants to donate great but go ahead and listen listen and, it's great and what um what uh, do you think really season good. three um was gonna be about so interestingly enough along came paul <laughs> yeah <laughs> do the 12 episode deep dive in the history exactly. of along came blind fairies we're available <laughs> um we are looking at uh friendship and adulthood between men that's okay. great as a as a seasonal theme so we are looking at at we're trying to this season i'm speaking very early so this could change but the season will probably focus on youth to old age cool and different stories related to that um so we just had a meeting yesterday we're in mid-july right now when we're recording this we just had a meeting yesterday and started talking about some of the we've been charting some stories and um I think it's just a conversation. I think there are such deep ripple effects with North American isolation and men. Mm. I don't think that's what this season, how I'm speaking about it right now, it'll be, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll engage the, the listener in a lot of ways. But 
I think there is a conversation and there are things, I think the emotional labor of partners with men, I think the deeper homophobia, not just with straight men, but I think culturally mm -hmm. uh, that's happened with um, tenderness. And I think also just if I could go as dark as this, I don't think that the massacre that happened in Las Vegas was because he didn't have any friends, but I think there is a lone wolf isolation yep. aspect to how we treat um, the way men are supposed to relate to not only men, but other people yeah. in, in North America. And I also think there's an, there's, an un, there's an unfair look at the rest of the world saying, well, men around the world, they hold hands or they, yeah. oh, but that's because a lot of those areas too, culturally, there's no, there's no cultural competition because yeah. men have subjugated uh, traditionally, uh, you know, uh, they've created these patriarchal roles. By God, this is becoming so academic. Yeah. But anyway, uh, that's we've talked about patriarchy. Literally, yeah, an academic fine, yeah. in the room. Yeah, fine. I. Uh, that's friendship, friendship and men. Yeah. That's what we'll look at. Um, not not to take away from the seriousness, but is there going to be an episode on Han Solo and Lando Calrissian? You know what? Oh, here actually about Han Solo and Chewbacca. <laughs> As a movie, a movie Wookies podcast that does text on about like you guys are d taking deep dives. Here's something I'm actually interested. Two film uh, references that I'm actually interested in looking at. Number one is not Han Solo and Lando, but James Bond and Felix Leiter. <gasps> oh, He's a big part of the new Bond movie. Apparently, is he? yeah. Like Jeffrey Wright is back, and it's like a huge part Holy of the movie. Holy shit! So that That's like because he never plays a huge role. No, he's apparently him. like a big chunk of the new movie. That part of the Bond legacy, I don't know so what it is. Interesting. I, I think of we're, nobody talks about it either. Nobody yeah. talks about it. I've, I'm very interested to look at it. The other thing too, and I brought this up at our meeting yesterday. This might actually end up as an episode of some kind or like a catalyst. Yeah. I was I had talked to the team yesterday. I was like, you guys have all seen Karate Kid, the original Karate Kid. And they're like, yeah, of course. And I was like, here's the movie that nobody would want to see or make, but I do, or I wouldn't want to make it as fan fiction. Is that, you know, in the beginning of Karate Kid, like he's a Jersey kid. He's leaving New Jersey. Yeah. Right. It's like, what if we made the, the movie about like the one friend, like his best friend that got left behind? <laughs> <laughs> like it becomes like his imagination of like what Daniel was doing out in California <laughs> or Daniel was sending him letters. Like he just become this dickhead karate kid or like He's, you've changed. Yeah. You've changed man. It's all the karate so changes. I want, like, I want the story of Daniel LaRusso's best friend who got left in New Jersey, be who maybe actually became like, you know, he's, He's whatever. He's a surf instructor. I don't know. But there's there's Polly this. Polly on Jersey Shore. Yeah. So we're we're actually <laughs> we're charting some stories or we're looking at some stories in real life that aren't. It's not about a crowdy kid, but we're looking at maybe doing like a the kid who moved to California. I love it. Uh, Sounds like a really sad Matt Christopher <laughs> book. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's what. Who knows? There there might be tears. Well, but, we can't wait. It yeah. Sounds amazing. It'll be yeah. fun. Yeah. Let's wrap it up. Let's do it. Uh, I'm Liam Billingham. I'm Josh Riopoulos. I'm Mark Pagan. And this was Mark is the stills. Is the stills. <laughs> so, uh, White